My name is Caroline Hallam and I'm your NC Live Instruction Librarian. Today we're going to be covering genealogy and local history resources in NC Live. Um, so we're going to cover three different resources. We're going to cover Heritage Quest and Sanborn Maps, North Carolina, which we've had access to through NC Live for quite some time. And then we're also going to cover Historic North Carolina Digital Newspaper Collection, which is um, a new resource that we just got this year in our new resource cycle. We'll also be covering some North, uh, so NC Live tools that you can use to make the most of your NC Live resources. And then we'll also have time for your questions. So some of what we're going to see, um, the, most, the top things that we're going to see today are um, the U.S. Census. We're going to see newspapers, ebooks, and historical maps. So if you have any questions, I see you all already found the chat box since we were having some audio difficulties just a moment ago. Um, but if you uh, have any questions throughout this session, throw them in the chat box and I will um, check them periodically and, and we'll get as many of your questions answered as we can. Just to let you know, the session is being recorded so that you'll be able to um, watch it again later. Okay. So I'm going to go back to nclive.org. And um, so the resources that we're looking at today, um, they are um, scanned resources that are um, either um, historical documents or they are um, sort of special collections materials. And those materials are not actually searchable directly through this search bar right here. Okay. Um, so what we can do here is um, there are some books, articles, videos, and other things that can really shed some light on local North Carolina history and the state's history in general. So this can be a great place to look for some tools. You're just not going to f be able to search the resources, the, the three um, uh, databases that I just talked about. We're not going to be able to search the content of that through this search bar. But just to show you, there are some great published, um, published local histories about a variety of North Carolina communities. So if I search for Cherokee, North Carolina, I'm going to see ebooks from some other databases show up that could be really wonderful for learning about that area and learning about the people that live there um, and learn about the Cherokee tribe. So we look that up. And just on the other side of the state, Let's go ahead and look at Pasquotank County. So Pasquotank County, North Carolina. Over here, we're going to see some ebooks that touch on Pasquotank County's history. Um, in addition, we'll also see some news and magazine articles that are going to um, cover what's happening currently in Pasquotank County. Um, so, you know, definitely look for your local history, your local community in the search bar. You, you might be surprised by what you find in our other collections. But if you're trying to search for this archival material for historical documents, you're going to want to go directly into the individual databases that we talk about today. Okay. And let me check the chat box. It looks like we might have a few sound problems. Okay, if you are having trouble with the sound and you are on, um, you're listening to the computer audio, that sometimes can be a little glitchy. So if you want to, um, usually the phone connection is a little bit more stable and you can find that um, phone number information in the um, email that you were um, sent about um, this session. So you can check back there or also check within the interface. There's, there should be a little um, audio button that you can switch audio. Little PSA there. Okay, let's get back into it. So we are going to start out in Heritage Quest. This is our largest collection of um, historical documents. The way that you can get to see all of our genealogy and local history resources is go under the search bar that we just looked at to our little browse bar right here. And we're going to click this teal button up in the top right corner of the browse bar right here browse all A to Z. So I click on that, and now I can see all 140 plus NC Live resources that we curate here. On the left, I've got my subjects that we cover here. So I can just go right here to genealogy and historical maps, click on that, 
and I'm going to get all of my NC Live resources that have to do with genealogy and historical maps. So we have six resources here. Three are the ones we're covering today, and those are the ones that NC Live pays for, that we license on behalf of the state. Then we also have three free resources that can be really useful for continuing your search. We have Archive Grid, which is um, a, a cross-searchable database of archival collections across the US. Um, we also have Digital NC, which is from um, UNC, Chapel Hill. Um, they're, they're digitized um, special collections and archival collections. And then down here, we also have NC Echo, which where you can cross search um, some of our North Carolina um, cultural heritage institutions and library um, digital collections. So those are available here on this, this um, A to Z list. But we're going to go straight into our most recommended resource, um, Heritage Quest. Okay, so here is Heritage Quest. Um, when you get in, you're going to see a lot of different information, but you're not going to see a single search bar. Um, there are Heritage Quest online is basically a bunch of individual databases that are not cross searchable. So you're going to see a lot of different really rich data collections in here. Um, now, the biggest collection, um, the one that this is sort of known for, are the US Census records which are accessible right here on the home page. Um, if you want to see all of the data sets that they have available, you can go to their search page. So you can get to search either by clicking search right here underneath Heritage Quest Online, or right up here in the top black bar in the top left corner, you can click search there as well. So this is where you're going to get to all of your data sets here. So you'll see we have the census. We're going to go into that first. Um, and then we have a few other interesting collections here that I'll talk about a little bit later. But I just want to show you how many collections they have here. These are their highlighted collections up here at the top. Um, and then down here, they have additional tools. They have maps and photos. And then they also have records in other locations. So generally, um, Heritage Quest is going to be best for your uh, relatives that have, were in the United States. So um, there are some records from other locations, but they're a little spotty, um, and they're, they don't really have the full coverage that some of these other collections have. But it's good to know that they're there in case you do have roots in these areas. Let me scroll back up to the top. So this is, so Heritage Quest Online, you might, if you've used Ancestry.com Library Edition, you um, are going to see some similar uh, data sets here that are also available in Ancestry. And that's because Heritage Quest Online is a light version of Ancestry Library Edition. So you have some data sets um, from that collection, but then there are also some data sets that aren't available, which we'll see um, how that can impact you a little bit later on. Um, Heritage Quest Online, generally the records start in the late 1700s, um, but there are a few um, exceptions to that. But for the most part, you want to think late 1700s and on into, into the present. Um, so then we're going to look at the census, but the search, um, search skills that we use searching the census are useful across these data sets. They all have very similar um, search functionality. Okay, so we're going to go straight into this 1940 census right here. This is generally a great place to start your family research. I'm going to search for um, it's someone we might know that was alive in 1940. All right, we got Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Now we could fill in additional information here. So here I could fill in, if I knew any of this information, that might help the um, might help Heritage Quest better find FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, I could also add a spouse, a father, mother, child. Um, and you'll see there's lots of different um, blanks here. This is the advanced search for this data set. If I continue to scroll down, we've got a lot of different blanks. And this is this form 
is based directly on the blanks that are on the original census form that the census taker filled out in 1940. Now, if you want more information about these blanks, what, any, uh, what um, this language means, you can continue to scroll down past that search form. And down here, you're gonna find an about field. This is um, a really great thing to check out whenever you're opening up a new data set in Heritage Quest, because it's going to give you um, a lot of background about what this data set is and what it's useful for. So here we have the background of the census. As you can see, the census started in 1790, um, and it talks about you know, the special circumstances around the 1940 census, how many people were brought into, uh, were, were covered by the census, um, and um, some things that you might find in the records, things that might be useful to you. So you could find your um, ancestor's address, you can find um, their age at their last birthday. So a lot of great things for doing your family research. Okay, so that's the about section. Always check that out whenever you're opening up a new data set in Heritage Quest. I'm gonna go back up to the top. So I'm just putting in Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I'm just gonna try to do that basic search. Now you'll see below each bar here, we've got this exact. If I click on that, I can add so if, if I know, if I want to exactly search for these words, I can do that. That's not really something that Heritage Quest recommends though, um, because there can be a few issues with um, these census records. You're not always, you're probably not always going to get an exact match. And we'll talk about that in a little bit when I show you a different example. Um, so generally I would say, start off with just leaving this um, as it is. Um, don't don't bother clicking this box because Heritage Quest, if I click search, will actually um, they have um, they automatically choose what generally works best for um, those uh, for that broad versus exact uh, uh, slider there. So for first names, they've found that broad generally works the best. For actually finding the person you're looking for and then but then they restrict it a little bit for the last name to exact and sounds like and similar so start off with that if you're really not finding your relatives you can play around with these make them a little more um, you know try to go a little more exact with them um, but generally I find good results just leaving these sliders the way they are okay so over here I'm going to see my results let's see if we can find all right, this is looking good, this record right here. We've got Franklin D. Roosevelt, oops, excuse me. We've got um, his wife, Eleanor, and they live in Washington, D.C. We're born in uh, New, York, New York. So this is looking pretty good. Let's click this record and see if that's who we're looking for. So here I'm gonna see my record. Um, I can view a map of their home in 1940. And I can, um, you know, read all of the information that we have directly that, that's been transcribed directly from the census record, from the original census record. So um, that's great, but you always want to check the original form and see if they're, um, if everything's been transcribed correctly. So let's click View right over here on the left on this image of the census form. And I am going to see the original form that the census taker filled out in 1940 um, when they were recording Roosevelt, Frank, Franklin D. Roosevelt. So here we've got lots of information about them. And you'll see that um, the record we're looking at is highlighted in yellow. But then we also have some other records that are highlighted in green. Let me just make that full screen. So I'm, to get around the record, I'm clicking and dragging to get to different areas in here. Um, but you can see he, his household also included his wife, his personal secretary, his cousin, governess, and then four servants right there. You can see their sexes, um, their races, ages, marital status right there, um, the highest grade that they um, got through um, in school or are currently in if they're a child. And then we can continue to scroll over and we can see information about their occupation. 
So here we've got um, his occupation as president of the USA. And then he worked 52 weeks in uh, 1939, and he's making 5,000 plus. So that's kind of fun. We can see um, information about him. And then in addition, um, if we want to, uh, we can also get some related tools over here on the right. So I was clicking and dragging to get around. Um, I can also um, use some tools right over here. There's a, a little um, hammer and wrench image right here. And if you need to, you can invert the colors. Um, you can flip it if it's not um, showing correctly for you, rotate it. Um, so there are a few different things that you can do to, um, to improve the visibility of it if it's a little bit blurry. Um, in addition, you can also zoom using this tool here on the right. And then there's also a little drawer icon here. There's a, there's a um, image of the drawer and then an arrow. That little button right there, if you click on that, you'll probably see the detail. So that's what we were looking at originally. We saw that um, transcribed detail from the census record. If we click related, then we can also see some suggested records. Now, when we click on one of these that um, seems like it'd be really useful, sometimes we'll get kicked back to the, the home page of Heritage Quest. So um, if I click my browser's back button, I can get back to what I was looking at. Um, that's where it comes in that this is a light version of Ancestry Library Edition. So this functionality was taken from directly from Ancestry Library Edition and plugged in here. And so this stuff um, may be available in Ancestry Library Edition, but it's not always available in Heritage Quest. But I found it, I just want to show it to you, even though it's not really a perfect tool, because I found it really useful when I was doing my family history. Um, over here, if you, you can find them in other censuses. So here I could click 1900 US Census and find FDR there. So here it looks like he is the son at this point. He's 18 years old. So you can find these related records. Um, you know, you can keep clicking on them and see if here we've got the find a grave index. So these, these connections are pretty good, it's just they're not, um, the actual record isn't always available in Heritage Quest Online. But it can be, it can be useful. Okay. So let me know if there are any questions. Let me check that, that chat box there. Looks like we're doing good so far. If you do have any questions, just throw them in. I'll, I'll check it back in just a few minutes. Okay, so that's where that's a search where kind of everything went right, where we were easily able to find Franklin Roosevelt. If I click search again, so that was up there at the top, and then click 1940, I'm going to get back into my census search, and I'm going to search for somebody else we might know, Elvis Presley. Let's search that. And I am not seeing him in this list, but I know that he was born in Mississippi. I know that his dad's name is Vernon. So I'm gonna try viewing this record for his father, who I think might be his father, and see if we can find Elvis. So if I continue to scroll down here, I'm gonna find the household members here. So there's Vernon, Gladys, and then there's Elvis. Presley. So if I want to get to a related record, I click on the, the name. So I was down at the bottom under name, click Elgis in this case. And we can see that there's something went a little wrong here. Let's go ahead and view the form and see what's going on. So there's Elvis and his family. I'm going to scroll in. And we can see that it was actually written correctly by the census taker. It's just that the person on the um, line below here, Audie, it looks like their name is a part of Elvis's. So the transcriber put in Elvis. 
So we can see that sometimes there is a mistake in transcription, but there also can be mistakes done by the census taker. And you can actually see that on this record as well. If I scroll over to the right, we'll see that there was an issue with between Audie and Elvis again, because if we go over here, we'll see that um, the, the census taker wrote, accidentally wrote that um, Elvis worked 48 weeks in 1939 and made 360, um, just in, well, anyway, 360 that, that year. So um, here, um, so that, that, that brings to light a few different ways things can go a little wrong. Um, so you can either have transcription errors, you can have census taker errors. Um, so when you're searching in Heritage Quest, you want to keep two things in mind. Be creative. So sometimes your ancestors, you'll find that they go by their middle name or they go by a nickname. So try those, anything that you know about that ancestor, try putting, try searching for that as well, because you never know what name they gave the census taker. Um, in addition, um, you might also just want to try initials. Um, generally, you know, that when we were talking about broad versus exact for those search terms, if you um, keep it, um, if you keep it broad, then Heritage Quest generally does just search for initials as well. But um, you can just try searching for initials and see if that brings your ancestor closer to the top of the results as well. Um, and then the second, so that's the first piece of advice is be creative. The second piece of advice is to trust, but verify. So, you know, trust the transcription, but then also look at the um, actual census record, the actual scan of the census record, and also find multiple sources. If you ever find a piece of information, try to verify it in multiple places before you, you take it as fact. Okay. So um, let's go back, and I can do that. I can get out of a record in the top left corner by clicking this back arrow. And I'm going back to my search page. So just a couple more things to show you in here. We're not going to go in depth in the other uh, interfaces in here, but I want to show you a few highlights. Um, over here on the census, we have our decennial, every 10 years census right here. But we can also click here on all to get some special schedules. So here we have um, the 1860 slave schedules, which can be really useful. Um, we also have um, Indian census rolls. So if you're not finding your relative in um, these, these other census roles, you might want to check out um, some of the special censuses as well, or also that, that can, you can cross-reference um, information that you find about your family in the same year um, across the different census roles. So that can be really useful. Um, I also want to show you, I'm going to scroll down here. And I want to show you the Freedmen's Bank records as well. So if we click on search now, this is really fantastic for finding African American relatives. So this is, um, these are records from the Freedmen's Savings and Trust Company's registers of signatures of depositors. And what's great about this is that the information that um, was required on Freedmen's Bank forms um, was pretty detailed. So you can find out a lot of information about your ancestors. Um, using this, these records. All right. In addition, you're also going to see um, this find a grave index. We saw that briefly when I was looking at the related records for FDR, but um, this can be really useful if you're having trouble finding um, a connection between a family member or you're having trouble locating them in the census. Um, this can this was useful for me when I was trying to find some of my relatives um, because it, it's just another another way another index of um, information about your family. So there are often um, if, if other distant relatives are have been researching, um, they oftentimes you'll find pictures of um, gravestones. You'll find um, you might even find obituaries scanned obituaries. Um, so this can be really fantastic because it's almost sort of like a crowd, um, crowd searching. <laughs> it, it, there are other people that are interested in the same people, and so they'll often enrich these records on Find a Grave.
So that's a great tool. And of course, this is, this is a free resource online, but it's, it's nice that um, it's also indexed in Heritage Quest. So you can sort of start in one place. Um, as we continue to go up, we've got the Social Security Death Index. What's great about this is that it actually goes through 2014, so you can find more recent relatives than in some of the other, other, um, other collections. Um, and then military records, I just wanted to show you something in here. Um, so we can get our, this is military records from a few different wars. Um, mostly the Civil War and the um, American Revolution, Revolutionary War. But then there are also some international military records here. And um, we've got a North Carolina collection of Confederate soldiers and widows pension applications. So if we click on that, um, this, is, this doesn't have that search interface that we've been playing with in the census. This instead is going to be a browsing collection. So some of the collections are not um, searchable in the way that, that um, the census is, but you can still get access to them by looking through the index um, and then locating, um, locating their records within here. All right, so that's a browsing collection. That was in military records. City directories can be great um, to find where relatives were moved within cities over the years. And then we've also got books. So if I click search now in books, it's gonna tell me what I'm gonna find. So basically these are family histories and place histories. If I, so I can search again for my family member here, but I can also browse my publications by going up to the top next to people. And if I click publications here, I'll see all of the books that are available. But I can also narrow it by location. So I can just look for North Carolina right here. And now I've got my book results. I'm gonna see a tax list. I'm gonna see written histories of different counties and areas. So let's go ahead and just put in, um, put in Kinston in my title and see if we have anything. So here we have the Annals of Progress, the story of Lenore County and Kinston, North Carolina. So definitely look through here, um, see if you can find digitized local and family histories that would be of interest um, that you can highlight for your, for your users. Okay, so that is Heritage Quest. Um, that's what I was gonna cover in there. Let me know if you have any questions about that. And, um, and, and one last thing I wanted to mention, many of you may be familiar with the census, um, but if not, 1940 is our most recently released um, individual census record where you can actually see the names and all that information we were just looking at for Elvis and um, FDR. Um, they are released 72 years after they were taken. So the next census is gonna be released um, the 1950 census will be released in 2022. Just FYI. Okay. All right, looks like there's no questions in the chat box, so we'll go ahead and move on. I'm going to go back to NC Live, to that browsing screen I was looking at, that A to Z list that I've narrowed down by genealogy and historical maps here on the left. And I am going to go into the Historic North Carolina Digital Newspaper Collection. Oops, let me try that again. There we go, that's what I should see. Looks like I timed out. So here is the Historic North Carolina Digital Newspaper Collection. This is the newspapers.com North Carolina collection. So this is also run by Ancestry. And this contains over 3.5 million pages of digitized content for over 1,000 North Carolina County newspapers. Um, the majority are from before the 1920s. And you can see that in our overall date range here. So here's the 1920s, you can see that steep drop off and there's still some available after that. So definitely you know, search for that as well. But this is um, where public domain 
and this, these the newspapers prior to the 1920s are in the public domain so that's why there's so much more available in this um, because they're, they didn't have to be licensed so on the home page we'll see a search bar that we'll get into and we'll also see a few different ways to browse and one thing I'd like to point out is if you um, ever need a refresher in this interface or if you need to get someone else started in the interface, there are two um, introductory videos about the introduction to the collection and then also how to search the collection. Definitely check those out. All right. I'm going to start off with just showing you some of what you can find in um, the Historic North Carolina Digital Newspaper Collection. So here, there are three different ways to browse, and I'm gonna show you all of them just in case you end up on any of the pages and you're just wondering what to do on there. Um, I'm gonna start with browse right here. And I will um, get into a list of cities within North Carolina. If I click this, bar here, this arrow bar at the left side of my screen, I can get back to my city list. Basically what's happened here is that um, Aberdeen, my first city on the list, only has one paper, has one year, has one month, and has one date available. And here are the four pages that were digitized from that paper. So as we can see here, um, there, the fact that they have a newspaper doesn't necessarily mean that they have a full run or even even more than one copy. Um, here you're going to see that they just had one um, edition of this individual newspaper, but they digitized it and they put it up because it could still be useful to someone. Um, so you'll see a variety of different levels of coverage. Let me look at, let's see, Graham, I believe, has a nice coverage here for the Al Alamance Gleaner. Here you'll see it's got a nice long um, list of years of coverage. If I click 1910, we're gonna see it's got the full year, it appears from here. Um, it looks like it was a weekly paper. So you can get anything from one edition of an individual newspaper to a full run. All right. So definitely look through here after the, after the session and see if you can find some local communities um, near you that could be useful to your patrons. All right, so that's the first way to browse, browse by city. Then the second way to browse is by location. So up in the top right corner here, I have a papers by location link. If I go back to the home page, I'll also see a C Papers by Location link underneath the search bar. So you can use either of those links to get into a map-based search. Now, if I um, want to see any of these individual areas, so if I want to go near Asheville, I can double-click, I can use this zoom option, and I can see what papers are available in this area. So here in Canton, I can see I just have one paper, the Canton Enterprise. Over here in Waynesville, I'm gonna see five papers. In Asheville, I have 42. So of course, I can click on any of these papers and search within that individual paper. So I can click on the Daily Sun. It's gonna get me to a view newspaper page. Or it should, there it is, I've gotta click again. And there we go, we have sample pages, we can search within the Daily Sun, we can see the coverage. All right, okay, so that was the second way to browse. That was a map-based see papers by location search. Then the um, fourth, sorry, excuse me, the third way to browse is by paper title. And we can get to that by clicking papers right up here at the top. And here we'll see um, that they are ranked by paper, paper name. If we are frequent researchers um, using this tool, we can also rank them by new and updated so we can see what things have been added most recently, which papers have been added or which editions have been added. We can also narrow down the newspaper title. So if I'm looking for the Robesonian, 
I can type in Robesonian and there it is. I can get access to it there. Again, I can also um, narrow by date. So we saw, we briefly saw this, probably you might have seen this in the corner of the map-based search. We also can narrow by date here. So if I only want things from like the early 1700s and I want to see what's available, then I can see I just have the North Carolina Gazette for that time period. Okay, so that is the browsing options. Those are the browsing options. I'm gonna go back home and do a couple searches. So in this search, I can put in a person or an event that I'm interested in. So I'm gonna put in Charles Acock, who was one of our former governors. Oops. Again, I'm, so I'm gonna see a lot of results here from lots of different newspapers across the state. And I can also narrow by date again, right here. Um, and I can also um, decide how recently I want them to have been added. So again, if I search for Charles Acock a lot in here and I want, just wanna see the new papers that have been added since I last searched, I could narrow down by the last three months and just see the newly digitized materials. Okay. So um, again, if I go back home and click search, I could also search for an event. So I'm searching for prohibition. And you'll see the dates are sort of clustered around two um, two times when we had um, referenda for prohibition. So we had one in 1881 that didn't work and then we had one in 1908 that did. So I'm just gonna look at the successful ones and I can enter in my date range right here. I'm just putting in 1908 on the left, clicking update. So now I'm seeing all of the papers that have the word prohibition in it from 1908. Now if I click on this first one, I'm gonna see the actual paper. And you're gonna see something here um, that I'm gonna explain right now. You can see that I'm not getting to the first page in this article. I'm, I'm on the fifth page of this paper and the article actually started on page one. And that's because these articles are, or excuse me, these newspapers are not divided up by article. They're basically just divided up by the individual newspaper edition and you're just search, doing full text searching across that entire edition. So basically what it's done here is it's returned the page that has the most mentions of the word prohibition because it's giving me a county by county report of that, that referendum. If I wanna see the start of the page, I can just go down here, excuse me, the start of the article, I can just go down here to the bottom and I can put in one. And here I go, here's, here's the beginning of my article about that's forecasting the vote of the, the referendum. Okay, I'm just gonna check the chat box, see if we've got any questions so far. Um, I'm gonna come back to that one, Sarah, just because um, it's about Heritage Quest. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll get back into that in just a second. Okay. If you have any questions about this, just throw them in the chat box. I'll check back in a little bit. Okay. So um, here, um, there are a few different tools you can use to navigate this paper. So um, over here on the right, you can zoom. And then there are more tools available if you click this down arrow here. So we can adjust the brightness, um, we can rotate it, all of that sort of thing that we might wanna do to help improve the how, how readable the paper is. So that's on the right-hand side, the readability. Then the navigation between pages, you've already seen down here at the bottom. In addition, there's also a film strip view. So if you just wanna zoom through different editions of the same paper, you can do so using that film strip. All right, now up here at the top, this is where you're going to find your um, tools for saving. So you can see I've got that find button. We've already got that open right here because I did a search for prohibition and it's highlighting prohibition, the word prohibition throughout this paper. So if I wanted to search for something different, I can do that. 
All right, back to days of Carpetbagger. Okay, so um, we can find that there. Some interesting articles in here. Um, then we can also close this search by clicking cancel. Um, and then, um, or reopen it again by clicking find. And then I have four saving options here. The only one that I really can recommend without any reservations is print slash save. This is going to be your most um, versatile tool for saving. So here I can click print slash save, and I can either save the entire page that I'm looking at, or I can just select a portion of the page. I'm going to do this reports from county forecasting the vote. I'm just going to do this headline here. And then I can either print it directly or save it to my computer. And so you can save it as an image or as a PDF file. Now, um, some people have asked me before, if you have a really long article that's not going to print well, what should you do? Well, what you could do is you could um, clip excuse me, um, print slash save smaller portions of it. So you could, you know, select this portion that's like, could, could print pretty well on one page, save that as a JPEG, and then go to the next um, part of the article and keep saving that way. So it's not ideal, but it's going to give you a better, um, more readable result if, that, if, if the article is really tall, really long, taking up a whole column there like that one is. Okay, so that one's really great. There's also a clipping option. Now this can be good if you or your patron wants to have a personal account and save everything that you're searching online. So if I click clip, it's gonna be a similar um, tool, similar functionality to what I just did with the print slash save tool. But instead of saving it to my computer, I'm saving it to an online account in this interface. So I can add some details. This is Prohibition, 1908, clip it. It'll give me some options to share it. Um, and then I can find it in my account. So I can view the clipping in my personal account, which I'm logged into right now. So we've got that article. Um, you know, then from there I can all, I can still download it and print it, um, but it's it's sort of a, a another step before I can get it onto my computer or print it. So, if you like to if you'd like to have that personal account, you can definitely use that clipping tool. That's great too. Um, now these two I don't really recommend. Um, share right here is going to share a preview of this page, and then um, when you click on the link, it's not going to authenticate you as an NC Live user. So it's going to ask you to create a free account, um, a free trial account for newspapers.com. So it's not going to recognize you as a library user if you use the share tool. So I really recommend steering away from that. Um, and then save to Ancestry. This is for an Ancestry personal account, not for Ancestry Library Edition. So if you have a personal account on Ancestry, you can definitely use that button. Otherwise, I would shy away from that one as well. So really print slash save and clip are going to be your best options. Just to show you a little bit about the clipping, I'm going to go back to my profile, go to my clipping, and here are all my clippings stuck together. Now if I want, I can make it so that these clippings are, um, these are my clipping settings. So I can have my clipping be public so that other people can see what I've been clipping and follow me. Um, I can yeah follow new clippings, show share options for new clippings. Um, to see more about the clippings feature here, up here at the very top, I've got a clippings button, um, and I can click. So these are my clippings. That's what I was looking at. I can also click all clippings, and I can see other things that people have been saving. So these are people all across the state that have been saving different things. If I like what they've been saving, I can go see more of their clippings. And I can also contact them or follow them. So this is sort of the social media part of this database that is kind of interesting. Um, so you know, this might be something that really appeals to you. It might not. 
you don't have to, if you want to create a free account and have clippings that you save online instead of on your computer, you can do that and not share any of those clippings with other people. So if I go back to my clipping screen, you know, I can make it so that new clippings are not public automatically. So I can also be a pri more private user. Okay, so we covered a lot in there. Are there any questions about, about Historic North Carolina Digital Newspapers? All right. Okay. Um, so it's looking like people are pretty, if you're still typing, go ahead and type it and put it in. Put in a question and I'll come back to it in a little bit. And if there aren't any questions, I will, I'll go ahead and go into Sanborn Maps then. Great. So this is our final resource of the day. Sanborn Maps, North Carolina. So this is the ProQuest Sanborn Maps Geo Edition. Let me zoom back out a little bit. And um, so what's great about this is it's got fire insurance maps from the Sanborn Map Company that date from, the, the entire Sanborn Maps Geo Edition collection dates from 1867 to 1970. We just have access to the North Carolina maps within that collection. So um, our maps generally go from the late 1880s to the 1950s, early 1950s. So we're a little bit less coverage than, than the entire um, map collection. Um, in this, you're gonna find 150 cities and towns across North Carolina. You're gonna find the maps of those towns. And these are fire insurance maps. So that means that you're going to find information about all sorts of things that would lead to risk of fire. So we've got building dimensions, we have construction, we have where windows and doors are, we have the property, um, where it's located, where the building is located on the property. So this can be really great for finding out about how your town has changed or stayed the same over um, the last you know, century and a half, really. Um, so here we can go into our um, uh, address search right here under to get started. If you click search by address or latitude longitude, if you know the latitude and longitude you're looking for, you can enter that here. Otherwise you can just put in an address. So I'm going to search for an address in, um, in Raleigh, 200 North Blunt Street, Raleigh, North Carolina. As you can see, that's the only state I can choose. Um, click search. And sometimes you'll see this, sometimes it doesn't go through the first time, so sometimes you have to try it again. And here I'll see my first map for that location is from July of 1903. So um, if I want to see the map, I can do so over here in the plate column. So if I click zoom map, then I can see the map for that area. So um, for those of you who are a little more familiar with Sanborn maps, you may know that um, the maps are actually freely available from a few other organizations as well. So they're also available from the Library of Congress and from um, North Carolina Maps, which was a joint project between UNC and the State Library and a few other um, cultural heritage institutions. So the benefit of this, this collection is that you can search them by address, like we just did. Um, and also, they go through the 1950s. However, as we can see here, they're going to be in black and white. And you know how I talked about how um, the information that's contained on these maps is all about fire, um, risk of fire? So part of that is going to be your building materials. And that was encoded on the original map using color. So we're not going to get all of the information from this black and white map. These the maps in this collection were digitized from the um, black and white editions of the map before they were hand tinted that had been microfilmed. Okay, so but here we can still get a lot of good information here. This is the governor's mansion of North Carolina. Um, if we want to find out what these symbols mean, we can go up here to the top and click map key. And here we have our key. Um, now you can see 
there, there should be color on here. So these are different colors that, that this would show in the color version. But we can still get some great information like that it's one story right here. Right here it's three and a half stories tall. Um, over here we've got this little white dot. And if we look on the key right here, we can see it's a non-combustible roof. That's what that little white dot means. We also have this, um, this dotted line here, along with dotted lines along the front of the mansion. So those dotted lines along the front of the mansion, we, if we look at the key here, it means it's a brick building with a frame cornice. So it has some frame um, accents on the front of the building. And then this right here means that it is a wooden walkway. So if we look, if we look at the um, governor's mansion, a picture of the governor's mansion, we can see, ah, okay, so this is what they mean by frame cornice. Um, right over here, they've got frame bits up here. And then they also have these frame walkways right here. So we can see it's a brick building with frame on the front. Okay, so if you want to see it in color, you can always go to NC Maps and find the same one that you were looking at before, and then we can see more information about how it was built. So here we can see the red means brick and the yellow means wood. So that, that can be something you can do to cross-reference. Um, you don't need to do that, of course, but um, that's always an option. And I'd also like to show you, there's also a map-based search. So if I put in a, a particular city, I'm gonna put in Raleigh again and click search. Then I can also um, pick a particular area just by clicking on it. And then I can see what maps are available. So I could go ahead and see that map by clicking zoom map, but I can also overlay it over a Google map by going over here into this column that says select all, selecting the map I'm interested in, and then down at the bottom, clicking view map. So it'll load and it will go on top of a modern day map. Don't use the actual built-in Google tools over here to navigate. Use these blue tools in the top left corner to zoom and also to pan. So I'm at the center of my map. If I pan up, I can see more. So I can see how Fayetteville Street has changed over the last um, century and a half. I can see what businesses were in there by using this slider, this transparency slider over here on the right. And in addition, if I wanna see how things changed between 1884 and 1914, I can do that by adding that map on. That's not a good example, let's try this one. Looks like these maps aren't overlapping exactly. But you get the idea. You can, you can also overlay this over another map. Okay, so those are the basics of Sanborn Maps, North Carolina. Um, again, if you want to click see the full map, you click Zoom Map, and then you can use these save tools right up here at the top. Save JPEG, save GeoTIFF, print, crop, etc.